morning, everyone. We move on to the second program of the day. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Professor A. Damodaran. He is Professor Economics and Social Sciences area and uh, DIPP Chair Professor on IPRs at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. He also holds, uh, I mean, as I said, he also holds the DIPP IPR Chair. He has extensive experience with uh, sustainable development strategies. B having consulted for the Government of India, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, the UNDP, the UNEP, and UN Convention on Biological Diversity on Issues Relating to Sustainable Development Strategies and Policies. He worked as Environment Fellow with U.S. Environment Protection Agency in 1994 and was USAEP Visiting Scholar at University of California at Berkeley during the same year. Damodaran was awarded the Homi Baba Fellowship in 2004. He was awarded the Devang Mehta Best Teacher Award in Economics in 2016. He was Obama Singh Scholar in Residence at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 2015. He has many papers in international peer-reviewed journals and two sole-authored books. Professor Damodaran has taught at the University of Manitoba in Canada, University of Wahan Ningen in the Netherlands, United Nations University in Japan, St. Petersburg University, Russia, and the University of Bonn in Germany. He is the author of the well-received book, Encircling the Seamless, India, Climate Change and Global Commons, published by Oxford University Press in 2010. His current uh, focus of research interest includes a very interesting part that is, apart from sustainable development, work on blockchains and cryptocurrencies in relation to various applications in the financial and rural sectors. In fact, that's what prompted us to invite him. Now, his talk will be on distributed network technologies for rebuilding Kerala, and that is going to be very relevant for us. A very good morning to all of you. Very special thanks to have uh, invited me. And uh, really thankful that I had to succeed somebody who did a dazzling job. I mean, the suits. Um, I think the compare started, I think you started by saying today is a Hartal day, people are depressed, and everybody was depressed, even I was depressed, and nobody was smiling. And then they came and made us all smile. Wonderful job they did. Now it is time for depression to come back. I'm going to put the PPTs in. My students were depressed, that's why I'm here. They have to see this every day. There's no risk. I think uh, this is my normal life. Um, having said all that, I should uh, say that uh, I am from Kerala. I am from Trivandrum, to be more uh, precise. I left Trivandrum in 1980 and uh, went to Delhi. Worked many for a few years in government of India and uh, worked with the Ministry of Environment. Worked in some important uh, global environmental conventions. Um, was part of India's delegation to the Convention on Climate Change and Biodiversity. So to a large extent, my forays in diplomacy at that point was practitioner based. Now, I have to tell you something very biographical. Mr. Neelakandan said that we got him because he knows about blockchains. Yes, he's right. But you don't know the torture I had to undergo from MSA Kumar and Nilakandan. They gave me a ring every now and then. We have chosen you as a speaker. But we don't want you to be theoretical and academic. Did you say that? You said that. And you're talking about blockchains, isn't it? I, I said yes. Then Kumar had a doubt, because Kumar has seen me for 20 years. Of course, he knows that I will do a decent job. <laughs> yeah. So Kumar had a doubt. Oh, you are not an engineer. How can you be talking about blockchains? 
I said, I am talking about blockchain, it's not blockheads. <laughs> so, I am not an engineer, I teach economics. But uh, thanks to the wonderful system that we have in IIM Bangalore, I have a lot of students who give me that simulated feeling of engineering. Most of them are from top institutes, engineering institutes who are my students. I learn from them, I teach them. The only difference is they rate me as a teacher, I don't rate them as a student. So here I am going to present my vision of Kerala. I am seeing Mr. Vijay Raghavan. We had met briefly when you had come to IIM Bangalore. I should tell you that after 1980, I had visited Kerala and studied Kerala, not Trivandrum, because I come from Trivandrum. I went to Wynad, I have gone to Iduki, I have gone to Patanantita, I have gone to uh, Alapi and studied problems of Nilgiri Biosphere Reserves and so on and so forth. Now, at this stage, I am trying to bring all those things that I studied. Kumar knows me from those days, from 1998. Very old person, you know, I'm talking of 1990s, and on a technology which is happening now. So I will just put all these together, along with my current work on blockchains. Uh, by the way, I think uh, Nitin uh, Sood mentioned that he wants to come to India. You know something? I am planning to have a startup in Estonia on cryptocurrency. That is the only place where I can do some business in cryptocurrency. Couple of my students from Estonia are going to be with me. And I was having this doubt whether I should start being an academic, should I start business? Still, I met Nanda Kumar yesterday. And Jose Dominic, he inspires me. He has a new startup. Sir, I am not saying that you are very old, but still, certainly you inspire me to start something on my own. So let me start straight away. What is my vision? There's no, there's no problem in putting forth your vision. Only problem is you'll be surprised if it gets done. So let me start. This is my idea. Kerala emerges as a role model of sustainability based on its biggest strength, which is decentralized governance. Kerala's Panjais Raj system is one of the most touted decentralization experiment ever done. People's planning was a Kerala idea. Only thing is, it is not necessarily based on sustainability idea. Now, what is sustainability? Respect for nature and nature capital. Kerala should emerge as a talent pool hub in distributed network technologies. The second proposition. And third, Kerala should generate jobs now from these enterprises. This is my vision. Now let me come to more specifics. I wanted, I'm, there's a lot of stuff written over there, but I'll try to summarize it. Kerala should have a resource quality index, which will be built, which should be constructed for each district of the state especially to map the vulnerable zones. Now we know about the flood last, I mean this year. The floods were terrible. It is not that it was the first natural disaster, but it was the first of its kind. Vulnerability has become an issue. And instead of saying vulnerability index, which is a very negative kind of a thing, I would say resource quality index. I remember in 1990s and early 2000, I used to work for Spices Board with people like Kumar. And we had a phenomenal problem of pesticide contamination of spices, exports. Ethion, particularly. Food chains were getting pesticide driven, 2002. After that, we have great stories of Kerala having to receive um, vegetables and fruits and horticulture crops. And there are even jokes about it, that it is all too beautiful and therefore it has some contamination problem, pesticide problem. In my view, not only because of my, the, the issues that I mentioned now, I think food safety is a very, very important issue in Kerala. And we need to have a food chain safety norms, perhaps the first in the country. These are all to be done first in the country. I'm doing some work for Himachal Pradesh on forestry sector currently, 
Himachal government, but that is separate. That state is different and the issues are different. Now, if you want to do the resource quality index and you want to have vulnerability mapped, you need technologies. And if you decide to employ those technologies, which is industrial internet of things, blockchains, and artificial intelligence, all put together, you can achieve the first two. You mean the, the resource quality index, mapping of vulnerable, have vulnerable zones, and then food chain safety. And for doing these technologies, you need a talent pool. You have to reskill the Kerala's human resources, reskill. Our skilling at, at this level is basically, we are about 20 years old. We have to be 20 years ahead of time. And if we have to be 20 years ahead of time, I believe that we have to take a, make a head start on these three technologies, the convergence of artificial intelligence, industrial internet of things, and um, blockchains. Now the other idea is public services should go up. Education, Kerala is, takes its pride on its education system. I studied in Kerala. I'm very proud of the fact that I did my master's in Kerala. But I think we are slowing down there. If you want to have a 20th first century leap with something which does not go beyond the 20th century, with the 21st century growth, it is impossible. We need to have in higher education in Kerala, there are wonderful places like Kuchin University of Science and Technology. But we need to have more radical thinking in the lesser known colleges, the higher education colleges. This is how Karnataka created its talent pool. Suddenly from nowhere, uh, IT started growing in Karnataka. But that has not happened in Kerala. Though Kerala was the pioneer in electronics way back in 1970s, it missed the IT revolution. So now this is the time for us to capture the next revolution, which is on distributed network technology revolution. I'm not talking of kiosks which teach you blockchain. I'm not even talking of that. I'm talking of systems designing, which is absent. We all create programmers. We don't create system designers. So this is something which Kerala could do. It can do it, and it has to do it for its survival. Then what do I do with all this? I generate money. I use the resource quality index and float a bond, if necessary, called a Kerala rebuilding bond. It will float well. If the resource quality index is seem to be going up and up, then obviously you are going to attract investor attention. And these investors come and put in money. If they are going to put in money in bonds, how do you requit the bonds? Yes, bond is a loan. So how do you requit the bonds? By generating revenues. How do you generate revenues? Because IoT, blockchains, and artificial intelligence is all about reducing costs. And if I am saving 50% on my cost of giving public services, the government, then obviously I can generate the revenues to pay off, government or industries. So this will be the business model. So now let me straight away get to the point. This is a map of Kerala, as you can see. Uh, sorry. Now look at this. Uh, now look at this map of Kerala. It's very interesting. Uh, can you see? I mean, you can see the map on the right side, which is a forest map of Kerala. It shows the density. Look at the dark green maps, I mean dark green districts. One is Wayanad. The second one on the south is uh, Iduki. And the third one, perhaps is a bit of uh, uh, the lighter green. You can see all over the place, Kodikod, Palgat, Plains, and so on and so forth, Patanampeta and all. Now this is the forest map of Kerala. Now look at the uh, topographical map on the left side. Again, Wayanad, it's a ghat area, it's a high altitude area. Now look at uh, 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 Wayanad, parts of Palgat and Iduki. Again, it is the same set of districts that are figuring. So look at the forest map, juxtapose it on the topography. The higher the land, the more the forest. 
higher the land, the more the ecosystem services. And look at uh, the, uh, the condition of these two districts. What is the contribution to the state GDP? Negligible. Because our accounting systems are wrong. We don't give any credit to them for the natural resources that they give. Now, I, I mentioned a little while ago that I worked for Himachal Pradesh. You know, there is a very interesting case. Himachal Pradesh is the catchment for Punjab rivers. Himachal Pradesh conserves its forests, gets nothing for it. Till about two finance commissions ago, the Himachal Pradesh government went to the finance commission and said that for whatever forest that we are preserving, we give so much of cusacks of water to Punjab, and Punjab has to give us a compensation. Punjab is giving a compensation. It is called a transfer payment in economics under the Finance Commission. Now, this is National Finance Commission. I am talking of State Finance Commission. It should look at districts in a different way. Districts which have contributed to natural capital, districts which are contributing to ecosystem services need to be given more allocation than at present. Now, this is also not the point I am trying to highlight. Now, let us go to this map. I did some analysis. This is, uh, you know, uh, in the climate change negotiations, there is a, uh, always a statement that communities and people are not interested in these issues. Only a few activists are interested in these issues. So how do you create a stake f on the part of households? We all look at our houses. In the last Kerala floods, it was the destruction of houses which was talked about. If each house had a commitment to a certain land of forest, like CSR, as you call it, corporate social responsibility, every household should have a responsibility for a patch of forest. It would make a very big difference to the affairs of any country in the world. Now look at the, uh, what, so what I did was, I took simple statistics from the Kerala Forest Department, 2016. And what I did was, the simple statistics, I combined it. Now, this is something which you can do faster and much more reliably through a machine learning process. That is a separate issue. Now, I find three districts uh, on the top. Do you see the blue, uh, the blue lines on the top above that uh, pink line? Pink line is the average. Now, this is the ratio of forest area to households. So I took the forest area as a numerator, divided it by the number of households, and I get wonderful figures. Again, it is Iduki. 0 0.970 for a, is a forest, in hectares, is the forest land available to every household. Now, look at Patanam Pitta, it is 0.475. Look at Wayanad, it is well above the average. So what does this mean? This means that every household can, for every house there, you get about 0.475 acres of non-house land, non-residential land, which is pure public forest land. Zero accounting. There is no value for that land. Now, my, if I were looking at policy in Kerala, I would have seen these maps. I would have taken a look at these maps. And my effort would be, to raise the number of blues of other districts. Ernakulam is way, way down because of the high density of population to forest area. Now look at all those blues have to come up. They have to go up. They have to cross that uh, yellow line, that pink line. That should be the target. But the question is, can they do it? They cannot do it. I remember in, 19, uh, in 2000 AD, I had come to Silent Valley. And Silent, under the Forest Conservation Act, we were supposed to look at alternative compensatory forestation for Silent Valley. Silent Valley cannot be replaced. It cannot be replaced. But we were looking for Silent Valley. And the Kerala Forest Department told us, we don't have land. Where is the common? This is not Madhya Pradesh, where we get another 100 acres just lying desolate. Kerala is thick in population density. So Kerala does not have land available to replace the forest. So what is the option? So these small districts, I don't have any hope about from Trivandrum to Kasargod, only about 15 districts I have listed. 
I don't have any hope that they can raise the forest cover because of these constraints. But the quality of forest cover needs to be raised. Quality means the species, the richness of the species, which can sequester carbon, which can make use of a lot of properties which are important in preventing floods. Runoffs are prevented. The kind of rooting, root system has much to do with the flood from the higher ranges. If you have very shallow root trees on the upper reaches, you're bound to get floods when there is an extraordinary rain. So this, these are, this should be a hot target for, uh, from a policy point of view of sustainability and networks. Now, I see another paradox. Uh, let me go back here. I missed out. Uh, I had another slide for some, oh no, it is coming. Yeah. Now, let us go to this thing. Here I did some other experiment. I took the population density map of Kerala, superimposed the river map of Kerala, because rivers were one of the biggest forces in the flood uh, issue, which happened about six months ago, uh, four or five months ago. Now look at this map, it is very interesting. So what I have had was, um, the maps that you can see, you can see those blue crosses, those are the lines. Idiki has the maximum number of crisscrossing of rivers. Now Kerala has about 44 rivers. 44 rivers, only three go to the eastwards, towards Tamil Nadu, that Bhavani section. 41 rivers go from the Western Ghats down to the Arabian Sea. And if you have those drain points choked, you are certainly bound to invite floods when the rainfall becomes extraordinary. Now, Idiki has the maximum forest. Idiki has the mac lowest, uh, perhaps one of the lower G GDP. And Idiki is also supposed to be rich in rivers. So the density of population and to the ratio of rivers that flow is a very, very important sustainability or resource quality index parameter. So I am summarizing the first vulnerability point. The highest population density, now I have not put that map here. There are two variants of that uh, data. It says in 2011 statistics says Malapuram has the maximum population density. Now Malapuram is the back, most backward district. Malapuram is a Malayora or what you call a midland or upperland area. Forests are high and it has the highest density of population. So this theory that you need to have a high density, if there is a high density of population, it will be followed by a low density of forest, this is absolutely disproved by Malapuram. Why does Malapuram remain backward? This is one issue. Now look at the low population density reserves. There also you find natural resource districts, Wayanad, Iduki, and Patanantita. Now there was a time when I, I used to work in all these three districts, and incidentally, these low population density, high forest areas are also the plantation zones of, India, of Kerala, rich in plantations. So Idiki is, and why not to some extent, is prone to landslides. We saw it. Lakes and reservoirs of Erragulam and Kotem belt are again prone to floods in the lower reaches. So we have, a, these are the primary vulnerability points as far as Kerala is concerned. Now look at this. Don't you see a string, a green garland from Ernakulam to, from Palakkad to Ernakulam running up to Trishur, to Kotem? That is your reservoir water bodies. So all the catchment water has to be taken by them. And if they get over flooded, then there is a, going to be a big problem for them. So the movement, so the Ghat forests, the Ghat districts, and have to be contributing to the ecosystem services, they have to be compensated for it. And if they are not compensated, we will invite problems in the lower reaches. Now let me come to Kerala rivers. This is another uh, statistics that I did. We have the river water basin, annual river water discharges. Now you can see the, where is the pointer to this? Uh, the pointer? Oh, oh that is true. No, I was thinking of it. It doesn't have a point. Okay, you can just see the annual water runoff. So what I have done is, um, it is in million cubic meters per uh, square 
per square meter. So what I did is I had the water discharge figures and the So now I get it. Uh, you went back and it is back. <laughs> so look at the blue lines above. Valapattanam, Muvattupura, Kaliyar, Meenachil, Manimala. These are the rivers which have an above average water discharge. The Muvattupura is a tricky thing. They get, Muvattupura river gets most of its water discharge because of the tail rays from Idiki hydroelectric project. Isn't it, Dr. Vijayaran? And because of that, non monsoon discharge is there. The problem of discharge is more very ordered. It cannot create a flood. But therefore, that is misleading. Look at all the other blue lines. These are the rivers which are giving some good performance in terms of water discharge in absolute numbers. Now, look at the next figure. This is sediment discharge. Now look at these three, Valapattanam, Payaswini, and uh, Chaliar are supposed to be above average sediments, sediment deposits. So you have a situation where, so ideally these reds have to be brought down and the blues have to be raised. What, what is required to be done? It is more, my, the, how do you reduce the reds and raise the blues? Blues means water discharge and reduce the sediment discharge. That is going to be where the technology comes in. If you have IoT sensors, IoT based, I'm not saying IoT works very well. It need not work very well. It's, and sometimes it creates problems also. But seven of my students are engaged in developing hydraulics for hydraulics, Internet of Things, and they have found that it is possible to work out robust solutions for the problem. So we need more point sources. At the point, you have to find out what is the velocity of water, does it vary from from uh, in a, during monsoon season, which particular day does it go up, which particular day does it come down. If you have well-organized IoT-based solutions, you will be able to solve that problem. You will be able to get the generated result. And the so-called non-point sources will all be pointed to one big uh, this thing, thanks to this technology. Currently, we are not able to tap and track a river water flow in terms of its basin. So that has been one of the biggest problems of uh, which we need to solve through technology. Now, technology is blockchain. One of these things is blockchain. Now, I foresee a situation where even blockchain will be replaced very soon. We can talk about blockchain for the next five years, but it will be replaced by a new system of ledgers. But as things stand, it is blockchain. Now, what is a blockchain? A blockchain is nothing but a cyber. You can imagine it as a rectangular piece. It is imaginary, but it is basically a block created out of transactions. Now, Kumar and me, we want to have a transaction, financial transaction. That transaction gets into a block. It is not through a banking system. That is a, that block, many transactions like that are required before a block can be closed. Traditionally, a block was one MB. So the moment the block becomes one MB, you have to close the block. When you close the block, you apply a mathematical algorithm to close the block because that code cannot be broken. You know, we do in simple lock systems. In good old days, we used to have numbers, right? Number locks. We have our own code to do that. And we do it in such a way that nobody else hacks it. Our passwords are done in that fashion. But this is a much more advanced thing because you are using a, using a hash function which has to be generated. If numbers get exhausted, you need new numbers. You need more computing. And if you need more computing, you need more power to cool down the systems. So it is an expensive process. Now this is the so-called Nakamoto blockchain project. But these days, blockchain, so one transaction is closed, one MB, the next set of transactions are lodged, they're all chained. It is extremely secure. Because you cannot touch one transaction without changing the entire chain. And the beauty of it is, there's not one single server or an officer in charge of server or a group of officers who control it. It is controlled by many people. You understand? I mean, distributed technology. It is not even decentralized technology. It is distributed technology. Many people are seeing, watching your transactions. So one, everybody watches and therefore nobody controls. And since everybody is controlling, nobody is controlling. And therefore, the old systems of financial institutions where 
banks will decide, one bank or a two or three officials in a bank will decide where the transaction should happen or what kind of in information should be kept, that is gone. It is completely uh, controlled. No, it is not at all controlled by any group of people. Therefore, it is tamper-free. The hash function makes it tamper-free. And therefore, it is a much more robust. So it is a ledger which is robust. You cannot mutilate and transfer and change the ledger. So if all the data gets stored in a blockchain, there is no mutilation of data. Data will be more accurate. And therefore, the blockchain will work as a good ledger for storing all kinds of information. Whether it is water flow or sediment flow, river water, everything is done over a historic period of time. So this is what a blockchain is. Now, blockchains do all this. Storing digital records, you can have land records stored, stored. You don't need a revenue office for all that. Exchanging digital assets and smart contracts. For instance, we give our uh, apartments that we own on rent, isn't it? So we sign a stamp paper with five uh, pages of stamp paper with impossible language and all that. So you basically do a digital contract and you store it up. And then you put an IoT device, a sensor in your house so that you can see what exactly, whenever some glass pane is being broken by somebody, you can, you, this automatically records. So you don't have to go like a policeman and inspect your own apartment and say, you broke this, you did not break this. Everything is there. So I'm giving a very small example of a contract. So like this, imagine bigger business contracts are put in a blockchain. It is robust because it cannot be changed. So this is what a blockchain can do, and it is done through an platform called Ethereum. Every blockchain ideally should be get a reward. The miners who sit and plan the algorithm and close the block get a reward which is called a Bitcoin. And a Bitcoin or an Ether. Now Bitcoin is supposed to be the biggest scandal according to a lot of people. There is no scandal. They, it is as bad as fiat currency when it comes to scandal. People say drug peddling, everything happens on Bitcoins. As if uh, the fiat currency did not have any of those problems. Every currency has its problems, and Bitcoins also has its problems. But a lot of blockchains result in cryptocurrency, but these days governments are getting into the space and they're saying, we'll issue tokens. Token means basically a block, again, which is closed. But government will issue a token, it'll be treated as an investment asset, and people can use it as an investment possibility. But cryptocurrency, is basically an alternative to your Indian rupee or the, to the US dollar. And therefore, it is seen as a threat by a lot of central bankers and bankers and all that. And it has been misused also. But the solution is the robustness of the blockchain is what you have to appreciate. And this is something which people are seeing it as a quality which needs because your digital records are st stored without any tampering. Now, th there is something called a hyperledger. Now, this is something Kerala can try. Hyperledger is also a blockchain. The ledger, which is called, it is set up by IBM, Intel, and SAP. They came together. It is on an open source platform. So no expenses on software. Everything is licensed. And Kerala can use it in its rebuilding scheme for all those problems that I listed, you know, for us. How much of water is contributed by which basin, which segment of the river in Idiki, Chaliar, what is the pollution load in a particular day. By the minute, by the second, it is captured. And why am I saying, why is it important to capture it in second and minute? Didn't you realize that in the last six months, five months ago when the floods happened, every minute counted. Every minute's flow counted. Every second's flow counted, isn't it? So I think we need IoT data collected and stored in the blockchains and then crunched through an artificial intelligence process to understand which basin has been the critical problem for floods. At which state should the reservoir release its water? The reservoirs did not know when to release the water. It was done in an arbitrary and, you know, in a, because they themselves did not have any judgment on that. So these are issues which can be solved by governance. So this is how an IoT framework looks like. This is not my picture, but uh, as you can see, the air, all the stations that you can see in the bottom line, air quality monitoring, all these stations, will feed into through a blue, Bluetooth or a, a long-range uh, system to a server. And then finally on the top, read from the bottom, go to that cloud. It is all put in a cloud. Cloud is not perfect. It is monopolized by Amazons and others. But today I hear that Jeff Bezos says that Amazon may go bankrupt. So I think you can safely put your materials there. 
You can have structural health monitoring. All these kinds of monitoring are done. I'm not saying 100% accuracy, because sometimes sensors are vulnerable to uh, ambient temperature and all that. So you will have problems. But definitely a lot of it is an improvement over magnetic resonance and other things which you use currently for river flow measurements. AI, of course. AI tools, as I told you, I said, I mean, I'll just explain because I'm running out of time. Uh, we have a deep learning component where you can visualize the data. So most of the decision makers would like data not to be put like data like I put it, put it beautiful in beautiful pictures. They will be able to use geospatial tools, bring deep learning in, and then it is relayed and decisions are taken because it is much more evocative. Now look at Amazon. Amazon has a system of beaming up the climate change problem on the sky and making it look very real. So a lot of decisions on emotions. I think the suits were talking about emotions. It should be part of it. The emotional decisions can be influenced by deep learning. So data, a lot of data can be crunched. So IoT-related data goes into the blockchain. From the blockchain, it is crunched and finally given to the decision makers. Now we have an uh, incubator in IAM Bangalore. My own impression is that we have a big problem of, one of you asked a question, round two and round three funding is getting to be a big problem for these new technologies. Prototype development is a bigger problem, not proof of concept. So we need to do much more work to see that that happens. So some of the sample ventures are like this. Belong.co is a company that I follow. It is a Series B funding. It has raised about $15 million and so on and so forth, like this. And these are the type of jobs. Look at the type of job, developer, enterprise, sales manager, architect, not the other architect. I'm talking of the data architect, account executive. So these jobs are not taken away by artificial intelligence. These jobs exist in AI companies. Now look at the range of jobs. Sales engineer, rails developer, technical consultant, technical program manager, principal data scientist. The amount of jobs that can come from this convergence, the diversity of jobs is very high. So that means your talent pool and education has to change. And the, uh, now let me come to what government needs to do. There is a concept called blended learning, which we practice in IAM Bangalore. These days, we have the massive online courses. And we use the massive online courses through you, which you can access from MIT or Harvard and carry on this, this thing. Then we have resource quality index building into all that. We have a habitat banking system. Everything is developed through the government mechanism. And the startup enterprises will take off from there. We'll have bonds issued on that. Edge analytics done. A lot of things can be done. Many jobs can be generated. And the economics, absolutely no capex if you're using the cloud. So capital expenditure is not ruled out. Operational expenditure will be a critical component for the startups. So this is the basics. And uh, finally, this is how it will look like. So you have on this side IoT devices. This is on a river stretch. Let us take Chalia River. You have all the IoT, one for water quality monitoring in different stretches, one for quantity monitoring on this side. And then you have a gateway, a gateway, and then you get into IoT Hub. All the data comes there. From there, it goes to the blockchain. From the blockchain, the data is abstracted, sent to the cloud for processing. There is reverse flow. Then it goes to the decision makers in Trivandrum to, through a visual analysis government as well as industries, and they generate the revenues, they pay for it, because it is quite possible for them to pay for it, because their costs come down. And through a bond, you can get the investors to invest in the scheme, and it will be paid in no time. At least this is my dream. Thank you so much. So I think you're all in a depressed mood. Thank you so much for that um, insightful presentation, sir, on uh, very science-based, actually, solutions for uh, rebuilding Kerala indeed in tandem with our uh, theme of this conference. I'd like to invite back on stage uh, Mr. Neelakandran to do the presentation. Meanwhile, with Sir's permission, I'd like to uh, you know, bring into your notice an example that uh, Mr. Mukund was talking to us about uh, 
blockchain yesterday he was using the example of a marriage to explain blockchain to lay people like uh, me and kumar sir so on to the stage sir. so he was saying uh, when a marriage happens how do we usually authenticate it we usually go to a registrar's office get a certificate but then there are these people who witnessed your marriage what if we could get the marriage authenticated with you know uh, through these people that is what blockchain technology does which is enabling networks to authenticate transactions i thought it was a fabulous example and uh, i'd like to remember sure okay yes mr mukund i'd like mr. to mukund. have you on stage please he wants you uh, i think uh, Mr. Mukunda, I thought when you gave that example of marriage, I thought you are a 23 or a 24-year-old wonder. But you are as grey as I am. So, are you planning something? Or? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I gave. I have a problem with my tenant. That's why I gave the example of landlord signing a rent agreement with the tenant. So each one has his own problems in life. May I take the liberty to invite Kumar sir also on stage because he's had a long-standing friendship with. Uh, so he's gone down. Okay. So in presence of Mukund sir, may I request Nilakantan sir to do the presentation? Can we have the memento on stage, please, ladies? Can we have the memento on stage? I request gentlemen to take uh, the center stage. So, so please join them. And to Damodaran sir, we'd like to assure you that you are not boring, nor are we depressed. Of course, the presentation was very information loaded, but then we'll all come back to you for more questions. It has to be. It has to be. It cannot be different. Thank you.